In order to post-process images in high dynamic range, it's essential to have a couple of basic tools. You'll need a powerful image editing program. I highly recommend Adobe Photoshop, although you can achieve a lot of these effects using a range of other applications, including Lightroom and PaintShop Pro. You'll also need a good HDR program. I highly recommend Photomatix Pro. It's also nice to have a few additional plugins that help finish your image and make them look really professional. I highly recommend the entire suite of plugins from Nick Software for Adobe Photoshop and PaintShop Pro. I also recommend the suite of plugins from Topaz Labs, specifically Topaz Adjust and Topaz Detail. And finally, you need a good noise reduction program. I highly recommend Noiseware from Imagenomics. I'm going to create a high dynamic range image out of this photograph of a pier that I shot a couple of years ago. Now a lot of folks use separate frames that they shot at the same time to create a high dynamic range image. I do mine slightly differently. I use one single shot that I shot in RAW at the time of shooting the image and then I create my component images using Adobe Camera RAW. So here I'm in Bridge and I'm going to go ahead and fire up this image in Adobe Camera RAW. Now the first thing to do is apply lens correction to make this image correct in two dimensions. And Photoshop's smart enough to detect what camera and lens you are using and fix any defects that might be part of using that hardware. I then apply some chromatic aberration correction. And this is important because it removes any fringing that might occur while post-processing your image. Now the next step is probably one of the two most important bits in this process, selecting the correct white balance. And You've got to make an artistic choice over here. I've looked through all the different settings and I've gone with the cloudy setting because I feel that that's what works best with this image. This next bit's the other important part of this process. It's establishing what's a good dynamic range for the image. Now to do this, one needs to slide the exposure slider back and forth and establish at what range the image looks best. And I've established between negative three and negative one EVs. Now I've decided to go with a spacing of negative 0.5 EVs between my component images and that'll give me five component images. Now that I've established a good dynamic range I'm going to pull the highlight slider all the way back to bring in as much definition as possible in the areas that are highlights. I'm almost ready to start creating my component images. I'm going to start from the first one at negative 3.0 EV and I'm just going to apply some clarity, vibrance and saturation of 50, 25 and 10 these are just some default values that I use out of experience that I've had good luck with. I'm now ready to save this component image. I'm going to use the Save Image button on the bottom left hand corner and give the image a functional name while saving it in its own folder. I'm then ready to move on to the next component image. Just change the exposure while keeping the clarity, vibrance and saturation values the same and then save it as another JPEG in the same folder as the previous. And we just continue repeating that process for the remainder of the component images. At the end of this process, we'll have five component images going from negative three EV to negative one EV, all spaced out at, at 0.5 of an EV. So now that we've created five component images, we're going to go ahead and load them up in Photomatix. Just navigate to the folder and load them up. While Photomatix is smart enough to recognize the order in which the images are arranged in terms of exposures, we still need to tell it what the EV spacing is. In this case, it was half an EV or 0.5. When you hit OK, you're greeted with a couple of options. Now, we don't need to align source images or remove ghosts because it's a single image that we've just created multiple components out of. I don't recommend using noise reduction at this stage, but I do recommend reducing any chromatic aberration. Once you hit OK, Photomatix will begin processing the image and loading it up in its interface. So here we are with our initial HDR image, and it doesn't look much, and that's because we've got to do a little bit of tone mapping on it. If you look closely by hovering the loop over and clicking on area, you'll also see that there's a fair bit of noise. Now we'll address all of this. It's also worth noting the histogram. Ideally we would like an even distribution. This one's slightly to the right, so we'll fix that. Now in Photomatix, you've got to work with the controls starting from the top to the bottom. So we'll start off with the Strength slider, and I'm going to set this to 90, because I do want a nice, strong, high dynamic range image created. The Saturation slider comes next. Not too much, just little. It's very important to be subtle, because you don't want to overwhelm the image. 
Next up is the luminosity slider, which controls the light levels of the image. Now I've decided to crank this back a little bit just to bring in a little bit more detail in the shadows. The detail contrast slider comes next, and this controls the amount of contrast that you'll get in areas where there's a lot of detail, like the grain in the wood of the pier. It's also important to be very subtle with this. I've just cranked it up a little bit to two. You'll notice that I've set the lighting adjustments to natural plus, and this is because I want to keep my images looking fairly natural. Next up is the smooth highlight slider, which pulls back the detail in the highlights. I don't want to do this over here, so I'm going to leave this at zero. The next two sliders are for white point and black point correction, and these are the two sliders that are key to helping you achieve a nice balanced histogram distribution across the entire image. The next slider is for gamma correction, and as it suggests, it just helps you shift the balance of color on the histogram. I don't use it in Photomatix because I do that correction in Photoshop. The temperature slider allows you to give the image a warmer or cooler look. Once again, I don't do it in Photomatix, I just do it later on in Photoshop. Going through the advanced options, the next slider is the micro smoothing slider, which I use in very noisy images, but in this particular image, I don't really need to use it. The saturation highlight slider, as the name suggests, helps saturate the highlights. Once again, I'm not going to use it, as I'll do any tonal correction in Photoshop. The saturation shadows slider, as the name suggests, adds richness into the shadow areas of the image. I've used this in this image, but once again, very, very subtly. The shadow smoothness slider takes out any texture and detail out of the shadow areas. I'm not going to use this in Photomatics, and we'll deal with any noise and smoothing in Photoshop. And finally, we have the shadow clipping slider, which, as it suggests, will clip the levels on the shadows. Now, this can bring some very radical effects, but it's not my cup of tea. Now, at this stage, I was satisfied with all the adjustments I'd made. I hit process, and Photomatic spat out an initial tone mapped image. I saved this image as a full quality JPEG in its own folder. This is the image that I'll use in Photoshop with a range of different plugins to finish this as a final product. I'll start off by loading the full quality JPEG turn mapped image into Photoshop. This image has got three very distinct elements. The water and the sands, which has got some nice earthy tones. The sky, which has got a lot of detail in the clouds. And the pier, with a lot of detail in the grain of the wood. We're going to use Photoshop's ability to manipulate layers to get the most out of this image. I started off by using the quick select tool to select all the elements that made the pier. I'm not being very pedantic about being very accurate, I just need to make sure that I get most of the elements of the pier that contain the wood grain. Now that I have a selection that I'm comfortable with, I'm going to modify it ever so slightly. I'm first going to contract it by 3 pixels. I'm then going to give it about 3 pixels of feathering. Now this helps avoid a harsh line between two selected areas. I'm now going to save the selection. I'm going to give it a functional name like Peer, so I can call it later on in my workflow. In the very same manner, I use the Quick Select tool to create a selection for the sky. And just like before, I save that with a functional name, Sky. I then need to create a selection for the water. Now there's a little trick to doing this. With the sky still selected, I loaded the selection for the pier and added it to the current selection. I then inverted the active selection, and voila, I had a selection for the water. As before, I modified the selection by applying some feathering, but I didn't contract the layer, as I do want this to spill over a little bit. And as before, I save the selection with a functional name, Water. With our selections all created, it's time to deselect all the selections. Now working from the background layer, I launched Nick Color Effects. In Nick Color Effects, I started off by applying the Pro Contrast tool, where I enhanced the dynamic range of the image. I then applied a graduated neutral density filter, running from top to bottom. I cranked back the upper tonality to negative 10%. I applied a second graduated neutral density filter, this one running from the bottom to the top. Once again, the upper tonality was set at negative 10%, but I used full blending and vertically shifted it ever so slightly. I then applied a polarization filter with 100% polarization. This brought out the richness in the blues. I then applied a gold reflector, but I ensured that I cranked back the light intensity to not overwhelm the image. Once done, I clicked on OK. 
Nick Color Effects applied these filters and created a new layer. It was now time to apply some selective adjustments. Working from the new layer that Nick Color Effects had just created, I loaded the selection for the pier. I copied and pasted the selection into a new layer and gave it a functional name. Then, selecting the layer for the pier as the active layer, I launched a plugin called Topaz Detail. In Topaz Detail, I applied the enhancement for Creative Detail Accent. This brought out the detail in the grain of the wood of the pier. By turning the visibility of the layer on and off, one could see the difference that this plugin brought in. Once again, working for the layer that Nick Color Effects created, I loaded the selection for the sky and copied and pasted it into a new layer. Selecting this new layer as the active layer, I launched a plugin called Topaz Adjust. Within the plugin from the HDR collection, I used a setting called Dynamic Pop to enhance the sky and the clouds. I gave the layer a functional name and arranged it in the correct order. Once again, by toggling the visibility of the layer, one could see the difference that this plugin brought in. And finally, to work on the water, working from the layer from Nick Color Effects, I loaded in the selection for the water and copied and pasted it into a new layer. As with the other layers, I gave this layer a functional name. Selecting this new layer as the active layer, I launched Nick Color Effects. In Nick Color Effects, I used the cross processing filter. I used the L05 filter to add a slightly different tone to the colors of the water and the sands. Once I hit OK, Nick Color Effects created a new layer with the filters applied. Satisfied with the way on how the image looked at this time, I flattened the layers. Now, at this stage, we'd done all the post processing for this image that we'd want to do. However, we still had a lot of dust specks on the image, either from being on the lens or on the sensor. Now, these are fairly easy to clean in Photoshop, either using the clone tool or some content aware fill, but it's just a matter of going through the entire image with a fine tooth comb and addressing every single spot that you might see that might distract from the real subject. Now the bane of high dynamic range imaging is noise and when you go to 100% you'll see that there's a fair bit in this image. Now this is fairly easy to clean up. Now to do this I'm going to launch a plugin called Noiseware from Imagenomics. Now Noiseware has a range of different algorithms that it uses to clean up noise in images and I just use the one for landscape because it seemed to have done a very very good job without being overly aggressive. With noise all taken care of, it was time to crop the image. Now, I'm partial to cropping my images to the golden ratio, which is 1.618. Essentially, take the dimension of one side and scale the image by 1.618. And as a finishing touch, I applied a little bit of vignetting. I used Nick Color Effects to do this, where I loaded it in and just applied about 10% of vignetting. And at this stage, I flattened the image and I saved it as a full quality JPEG. So here we are finally, from a straight out of camera raw file to a finished high dynamic range image. Let's take one final look at how we went, starting from the original raw file, the five component images that we created, the tone mapped HDR image, and the final completed HDR image.